Good evening, everyone, staff members and members of the public. And we have uh, Journal Pioneer here, represented by Carl McLean. We have our Director of Finance and our, direct and our CEO, Bob Ashley, and our Director of Tech Services, Aaron McDonald. And we have our Director of Human Resources, Gordon McFarland. And we have our Police Chief, Dave Poirier, and our Director of Community Services, J.P. DeRogier. And uh, Brian Harlick is running the controls here. So welcome to members of the public. And also, for the second time, I believe it is, we're live on YouTube and the, and the net. So uh, uh, we say hello to all our viewing audience, as well as uh, residents within City Hall here tonight. The number of committee meetings to go on, and we'll continue on. Start with tech services. Councillor Duran, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I'll be using this microphone tonight just due to technical <coughs> difficulties on my desk. Um, we'll call technical services um, committee meeting to order. There are a couple of items on there. Um, the first one, uh, it's, it's listed on there as Pope Road update. I guess the story behind that is when uh, you're looking for uh, agenda topics. I was curious as to whether there might be an update for the property on Pope Road, the, the, the burned out uh, government garage, old government garage property. And what happened was I, I requested it to be on the agenda if there was an update. And it went on the agenda and I wasn't sure if there was an update and it got, it got left on the agenda. So really there's just one item uh, for technical services and it's just kind of the, an update on all of those uh, CS11 properties as a whole, so that would just be the one item tonight. Um, I did meet yesterday with uh, Director Aaron um, and uh, CAO Bob and Mike Straw um, from Tech Services um, just to go over that Pope Road uh, property, and it turns out that there are a few little minor updates, and uh, Aaron will go over those in little, probably a little more detail than I could give. Um, and I'll just hand uh, hand that over to uh, Aaron McDonald now. There was uh, four properties that are currently in pro various stages for the CS11. Uh, the shortest update, I guess, would be on 99 Duke Street was the demolition from a year or more ago and left with the foundation. <coughs> Where that one stands is we've been in touch again with the property owner He's been choosing the option of removing the whole foundation, but he needed to have the existing foundation surveyed so he could rebuild on that footprint. He's had, uh, we think in the last week or so, he's been, the surveyor has been on site to pick up the locations and we're just waiting to get that confirmation that that information has been captured and then they, their plan was to remove the existing foundation and fill it in and then rebuild that on that site at a future time. So that's, go ahead. Uh, do we have timelines attached to that? Uh, we told them we would even, if they got the information to us of who the surveyor was and we spoke with the surveyor to know that they actually did capture the information, we wouldn't wait until the actual uh, paperwork came to us because there's a lot of field work that's trying to be finished up by surveyors and then there's a backlog in getting the actual paperwork. So we said even if you get the field work done, have the surveyor contact us then we'll just issue them the demo order on the f on, and let them proceed with the... So that's just the quickest update on, on that one that that was progressing. Uh, up on... The other two are similar, Palmer and Elm Street. Both were uh, fire damage buildings. Both buildings that we understand are, are f I guess, fixable to some extent, as far as whether it's from the foundation or the, the bulk of the building. Staff have not been inside either of the two buildings. Both buildings have been drawn out through insurance and finalizing the um, the owners and the and the insurance companies are still finalizing their um, claim. I guess you'd say what the amount of insurance, what's covered, what's not. Both have had uh, legal counsel representing themselves, so we've been in touch with both property owners legal counsel to sit to confirm that yes this is the status uh, both of them are working separate lawyers are working on their clients behalf to get the claims finalized with their insurance so that they can 
make their decisions of how much the claim is and what they can do with that to rebuild or, demo or demolish. So, go ahead. So, um, the timeline, does, is there a timeline on that, Aaron, or are we just waiting for? Um, uh, I didn't have the timelines uh, with me there. I, I guess we can get them for you for the, I was just trying to update that we were dealing with the, I guess we felt uh, at a higher comfort level that we were dealing with an, uh, uh, the lawyers to say and confirm that the uh, we we're having some troubles previous to that getting in touch with the property owners themselves so we were referred then to the lawyers that were representing them so to confirm that yes okay. the insurance has been a, uh, a time time lapse to get that finalized okay. they're expecting it to be soon but I, again I, I can't comment on when it is okay. I'm not sure I dig through our letters of when the time frames were that they had to I don't know if we're at those dates. I'll, I'll have to provide just a, a written update on that. Okay, and I guess so one of the questions that I could ask, and I'm not sure who would have to, to lead this conversation with either the lawyer or the owners, but on that particular building on Elm Street, like the, the bay window or the big window was smashed out and there's glass everywhere and the neighbors are just concerned about the safety of their children. And so if we could at least have that part cleaned up and then we'll wait for whatever, um, feedback we get from the lawyer and then I can get back in touch with the folks that are that have the concerns and okay we, we will go by the site and verify that the windows are and who the contact would be to get them boarded up okay I, I the windows are boarded up but all the glass is left on the on the um, on the step or the patio or veranda whatever you want to call it yep. so I think if kids wander up there I think they just want it cleaned up and uh, yeah I was there myself so yeah. I did see that so anyway thank you Aaron now, the, the owner of that property had just three owners yeah. listed, and if that was the one that was had uh, trees all down, the, the sheds were in disrepair, they, they did clean up the, shed, the sheds, they did secure the sheds, they did take down the broken fences, and they did clean up all the trees, so they, they had been cooperative to try and do as much as they could outside of the structure itself to try and clean up the property. Right. <coughs> okay. There's just yep. a few more things I yep. think would make people happy. Thank you, Aaron. Yep. Uh, just the one on uh, Palmer. That's where we're going next. Okay. Go ahead. <coughs> Is we had been the same situation with that one as far as um, hadn't had much contact with. We did bring it back to council and we had an order to secure one of the outbuildings. Uh, we did do that. We have since heard from the uh, the property owner as well as their lawyer that he's trying to investigate what all he can do to fix up the property and as far as the building. They're still waiting until they can get a determination of what they're actually going to get and and what can they d he's now at least thinking about what can i do with the property how can i fix it up and do i rebuild what's exactly there or fix what's there so while he's waiting to get the insurance part finalized at least we know they're looking at their options beyond waiting to find out what the settlement is so they're looking at investigating what all they can do with the property uh, i guess my question would be uh, I, I know there's a large tree that has fallen during the storm. It, it was half over on the neighbor's yard there at one point. And there's, there's some, I think, uh, lack of respect amongst maybe some of them in that area to, like for, from the owner towards the neighbors, to be quite honest. And I, I would like to see us sort of do whatever we can do on our behalf to maybe push it along as quick as possible. I think it's an uncomfortable situation from my understanding with talking to some people in that area. So uh, if we could do whatever we can to make sure that, you know, if, if we have to go on to make sure that a tree gets removed properly or whatever, it's just, <coughs> I, I don't want another 99 Duke Street that we're, we're here in two years saying, what can we do now? It's just, things seem to drag on way too long. So if we could figure that out, that'd be great. And I think I'd have to look back to the actual notice that went to them there was time frames i don't know if we're at those time frames uh i just know that we just said well looks we'll give you an update of anything new we know if they're i don't know if we're at those dates if we're at those dates and past we'll be back to you with a, a resolution to say what do you wish to do on this property yeah. so the, the last one then was uh pope road um the the quick recap was obviously the fire, the insurance that was still going on after he found out the amount of insurance and what all they could do. We went through a process of getting plans for the, 
for the rebuild and repair. Um, permit was issued from our department to do the repair and, and, and renovation. Within the, within the same week, a, um, how do I say, a request or a complaint came in to another provincial department and they asked us to go up with them and monitor this or review the site so that we knew as far as what was going on for the plans. Um, as a result of that, the provincial agency issued a stop work order. Um, the owner of the building had a contractor that we know works in the city lined up to do the, when he got the permit from us, to do the work. Um, I'm not sure how long the process was stopped through that stop work order, a month or more. That contractor did not wait to, couldn't wait to do that job, went on to do other work. So we've been dealing with the owner to find out if he's been successful in either finding other workers to do the construction work. Uh, he was having, diff as part of his own stop work order, there was other things had to be done. One was repair the doors outside, or the, the big man doors, or the large doors outside. He needed to prepare a large uh, wall separation inside the building. He had the lumber materials there that we saw ourselves. Um, since then, or since then, the, the doors have been put on. The inside petition is now up. So we understand that that stop work order has been lifted, that his workers can now be inside the building. There was other crews there prior to that. Uh, I'll say license our professional cleaners or restoration company to do some of the, the cleanup to clean up the area where they're going to be working. So we know that they have been making some progress on it, just not to the level or satisfaction of everyone. But again, we knew that he did have a contractor hired when he came in. We did talk to the contractor and they were prepared to start. And then the stop work happened and then he could not stay with that job and had to move on to other jobs that he had in his queue. So. That's the only update as far as we know that there was comments made that yes, there was people coming and going. We understand now that the inside wall renovation has been done inside the building. There was cleanup done and the large doors have been reinstalled. Again, it's not happening as fast as everyone would like, but there's, I'll say, uh, some progress being made. Any questions on that or comments? Um, do you know if, when you mentioned the large, like the bay doors, um, no. Did they plan on doing all of them? Or do you know? Uh, again, I, I don't know the details of the scope of this permit that he was that he was issued. I just know that at some point, I think some were fire damaged or yeah, I down. Just, yeah, because I just the, you just mentioned that yeah. the doors are done now, but I know there's still a couple that are quite charred. So yeah, and then whether that means are. structurally or yeah. whether they're there to make the area secure, a work warm work environment this type of year for his workers or, uh, or not, I don't know. But they had to get so much done to make a an indoor environment for them to work and not be outside in days like today. Okay, so obviously we're going to monitor that and December 31st is the day where essentially everything is supposed to be done. Realistically, we know it won't be, but we'll, we'll certainly keep an eye on it. Um, at Council that point, we'll have to advise you and update uh, what the current bylaw shows and what your next uh, steps according to your bylaws are and you guys will have to make a decision. Okay, uh, Councilor McDougal? Yeah, no, I, uh, as I said before, I drive by this every day and it's, uh, it's becoming an eyesore and uh, we need to get it fixed. The yard itself, let alone the building, is uh, not a, you know, very appetizing for the neighborhood around there, so we need to have something done. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamill? I seen in, the, in their agenda the Cobra Road twist thing. I thought it was a Cobra extension, of course. Well, I can mention that after we finish these ones if you're done yet. But I, I just wanted to make sure, and I think you know that the, the mayor and all the councillors are behind you 100%, whatever needs to be done. So you certainly will be with yourselves available. On, on that project, we're still continuing with the design team to work on a design to uh, have something ready to bring forward to us for budget time to say. Uh, Here's a design uh, and a budget. I think we're still exploring funding opportunities for that too. Yes. Um, yep. Whether it's you know help from federal, whatever, something that we're not going to let uh, fall between the cracks. That's for sure. Just yep. as we do with every project. We'll, we'll bring it forward with a, a budget time with whatever else we have uh, funding sources or applications we've uh, submitted for, so we can know what the. Viability that is, or what our contribution would be, or 
for if we if we have those funding partners or, or not. So, uh, Councillor McFeely. Yeah, I think just picking up on Councillor McDougall's comment on the on the property on on Pope Road, and you know, I guess I'm of the impression even if the building is fixed up to whatever um, standard it was at before. Um, it's still unacceptable to have a property like that in the middle of the city and residents having to look at that on a daily basis. So, you know, there's a junkyard out back. There's a, so I don't know, you know, the information that's been passed on to the owner in terms of, you know, getting the building fixed up. But there's, in my mind, there's a whole lot of issues other than the building there. I agree, and I don't know how we address those because does this does the CS 11 address those I guess well I guess if I'll comment on a couple of them is that it's a large property that's owned industrial in an industrial park it's a whatever many acre site what used to be there for 40 years was a government garage piles of gravel piles of shale snow plows that left 24 7 this time of year heavy equipment graders everything that was there culverts it was an industrial site the gentleman bought the industrial site, converted it over to, maybe everyone's not, you know, it's a garbage recycling business. It's not an attractive business, but it's a, he's in an industrial site, a large site that existed there before any of the houses were there. You know, like. Yeah, I understand, yeah. I understand that, uh, but I guess I wonder, do we have any options <coughs> um, at yes. our disposal to try to rectify the situation that's there, irregardless of the building being fixed? Yeah. I think that's a, a bigger discussion for it to have at, an, at another time because I, that topic came up probably in 2011 with the, some of the previous council and we'd have to recap all that for us at another time when we got prepared with the background information from 2011. Well, I, you know, I, I think that I, at least I sense there's an appetite in this council to try to, to, try to uh, deal with that whole situation that's out there. So yeah. I would welcome the opportunity at some point to be able to kind of get a historical perspective on it and what our options might be moving forward to oh. begin to alleviate that. We can do a search of the articles at least that were in the, in the papers and we can circulate what was out there from 2011 when there was meetings held and uh, when they were the gentleman tried to buy the property and the discussions back and forth and uh, we can circulate those for you for sure for background reading. I think the unsightly is going to continue to be problematic insofar as it is an industrial zone so the, 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 the level of standard that you want to apply everywhere else in residential areas going to be difficult uh, but in the long term uh, we do have a future land use planning map and uh, if the aesthetics of the property are difficult to deal with now that land use map could be amended such that whenever that operation shuts down or sells or whatever, it no longer will be industrial land. It would have to revert to whatever, commercial land or, uh, or residential property. But that's a longer, longer term solution, but uh, I don't want to say that's the only card you've got left, but it's, a, it would be, it's going to be a difficult one when it's already zoned <coughs> industrial. So as Aaron says, I think that's going to involve a more in, more in-depth discussion of, of that piece I, I just do have a question on that um, because I, I wasn't aware when that point was made by director Aaron that that was over 40 years ago and that it was deemed as an industrial site so at that time would we have anything on record or in the minutes or <coughs> anything that showed uh, you know, where there were any comments or anything or people were agreeable to that coming on. Obviously, if it's there, there, there didn't seem to be any opposition back then. So I'm just wondering now, how would we apply that if it's already deemed industrial? So that would be prior to that, amalgamation. Yeah. Okay. A future land use map is more or less a policy vision for the future. It doesn't uh, dictate the present. It can't dictate the present because, you know, people have as of rights where they are now. But certainly for future, uh, you may want to change the zoning up there. And you can do that through
through an amendment of the official plan. But to you, Mr. Chairman, having said all of that, I know we talked about the zoning and 40 years ago and everything, but still, we just can't look at what it was 40 years ago. We have to some way, shape, or form get it cleaned up some way that it's at least decent in, in the area. So, and that's been discussed and been worked upon, but it's not easy when something has been there for, for that long, even before amalgamation. But uh, uh, I know the city staff and city council wants it cleaned up to uh, something that everybody can live with. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Your Worship, and thanks everybody. Um, like I say, we'll certainly monitor not only this one, but all of them and, and uh, as they approach their significant dates and uh, deal with uh, matters as they come up. And of course, after last night, there's gonna be another property that's gonna need uh, lots of uh, cleanup. The house that burned on uh, Beaver last night. So um, I guess that's it for uh, tech services. We'll uh, move to adjourn that, I guess, if my vice would like to do so, and I'll second it, and uh, I'll hand things over to Municipal Services. Councilor McDougall, Municipal Services. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, uh, Councilor Ron. I'll call the uh, uh, Municipal Services Committee uh, to order. Uh, we only have one item on the agenda, and it's 94 Ottawa Street renovations. Excuse me. The uh, Summer, City of Summerside Electric Utility Main Office building was assessed in 2017 for its building systems and general functionality to house operations staff for the utility. The uh, building was built in 1974, is currently 35 years old. In 2018, the exterior of the building was uh, renovated with new overhead doors, new exterior cladding, and new windows where needed. In this assessment, it was uh, uh, also identified of the state of the building interior systems for mechanical and electrical uh, were required to be updated. During this time, it was also identified to create some new areas in the building to support training needs and additional office space for staff. Uh, see the uh, staff uh, attached uh, tender recommendation for the WSP group and the original building assessment. The alternatives to this is do not renovate. Uh, the current building continues to deteriorate. Build a new building, more costly than the retrofit and have already invested in the exterior cladding renovations. And uh, reduce scope of renovations. Uh, there's very few on opportunities for reductions as renovations were reduced in scope from the onset of the design. The advantages of the uh, rec uh, renovating the main office for the utility operation, it will see the utility needs be met for the next 40 years. The heating system, system will be changed from oil-based to electricity-based, which will see a savings of operations approximately $20,000 a year. Disadvantages, this project is over budget by 400,000. Original en engineering estimate in 2016 was approximately $1 million. Uh, the cost on uh, the 94 Ottawa Street renovations uh, approved in the budget was $1,068,750. $75,000 of the engineering design already committed with $993,750 remaining. And the cost, as you'll see, Next will be one million uh, two hundred ninety-nine thousand plus one hundred ninety-four thousand plus eight hundred fifty HST, and the electric utility receives a HST back. Um, maybe Greg, do you want to? I can read the rest of it here. The recommendation, or do you want to talk on it first? Or sure, I can a, talk. On give a us bit. a Reader's Digest version. What we're yeah, sure. So the, the engineering estimate was done um, by the engineering group hired to do the building assessment in December of 2016, mm -hmm. pretty close to 2017. And then the budget would have been submitted into council um, probably in late 2018 for determination 2019's budget. 
so in reality the estimate was about a year old when it was submitted unfortunately the time period between the estimate and construction there's been fairly heavy increases in the construction industry which I'm sure a lot of people are hearing about with availability of resources and cost of building materials increasing in price throughout the construction industry so that manifested in a fairly substantial overage to the estimated budget that was presented to council for the 2019 2020 budget when we went out to tender so you can see through the rest of the report the the tender values that came in were fairly tight in the construction industry they're all within roughly a hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars of the four bids so this this recommendation tonight is for the lowest of those bids that met the specifications after review and so but the the real issue for council to decide is do you want to invest in the overage for the building and proceed and the plan would be on how to handle that for budget would be to stay within the million dollars this year's budget since the project construction time is from January until the end of May next year and probably most likely will go into June that we can actually span the cost of the project over two budget years but that would mean that we would dispense the million dollars this year for the renovations and have a request come into council in next year's budget to be on the items as to roughly 400,000 the explanation as to why 400,000 and not 300,000 is because on top of that there's usually a few unknowns that happen in construction so we've added a contingency of 7% which is uh, fairly tight normally it out 10 to 15 percent for contingency but since this is a fairly detailed design we feel comfortable with 70% contingency and that's why of the extra hundred thousand in the project for 400,000 that kind of explains the ask and request of the Municipal Services Department to update a building that's aging and deteriorating in the electric utility operations okay thanks Greg I'm Mr. just gonna read the rest of this into the uh, record so that it'll be uh, on the, the project as uh, director Greg had said yeah, just the thought there is we're talking about a 35-year-old building that needs work, but across the street we've got a 65-year-old or close to a fire hall with the roof blown off with holes in it. We've got the basement not fit to go into, and the main floor not in very good shape. So I'm just wondering the, the pecking order here, if uh, which, which is which sort of thing, and maybe that'll be something that'll be discussed during budget, but uh, we found out during the storm with the roof going again and the leak and no elevator to get people in there and all kinds of things. So my gut feeling tells me that the fire hall maybe should have a little priority over this, even though this building has to be replaced. Anyway, that's just getting my two cents worth in or five cents or whatever value they want to put on it, but it just doesn't seem to fit quite right in the system. Okay, thank you. And I'll just read this and then we'll I'll open it up for discussion from the floor. Uh, so the project would be completed uh, from January 2020 through to May 2020, and will span over two yearly budgets, as explained. And it's recommended that the tender be awarded and that the increased cost be budgeted in, in the budget year of 2021 uh, at a level of 400,000. It would be $305,250 overage plus contingency at 7%. So the recommendation whereas tenders was issued for 94 Ottawa Street building renovations and the following submissions were received. The firm Williams, Murphy and McLeod, uh, 1993 limited. The price excluding HST was 1,299,000 with a project length of 19 weeks. McLean's construction, $1,368,500 with a project length of 34 weeks. Wellington Construction at $1,369,018 for a project length of 29 weeks. And Strategic Construction, uh, $1,440,000 uh, at a uh, project length of 14 weeks. And the staff recommends awarding the contract for the 94 Ottawa Street building renovations to Williams, Murphy, and McLeod, 1993 limited. Uh, in the amount of $1,299,000, taxes included. And with that, I'll open the floor up for discussion. I'd like to make another comment, but I want to, yeah. don't want to jump ahead of anybody. I, do I see any other red lights on there? 
for speaking lights, I should say. Uh, this is a general fund budget, not a utility budget. Pardon? Oh, okay. So, come budget time, when we're trying to do something uh, regarding the fire hall facility, uh, we don't want to get ourselves into a situation, well, we had to fix the 35-year-old building and the 65-year-old one can wait. I, I, I'm, are we sure we're ready to go with this right now? And, and this is December, and we budgeted for it in 19, and we're talking about it now. What am I missing here? I'm not being critical, but no, I just, no, just I things are not just quite adding up. I hear you, and um, uh, I Corey? guess um, I'm on the same page as His Worship here that uh, you know we I, we got to put some things in perspective and you know order of merit, I guess, and uh, I, I understand that it it was a previously budgeted. So how did how would that work now? It hasn't been spent, obviously. No. Would can we roll that? Like how how does that work at this point? I'm, I, I'm a little bit unsure. It's a, obviously not a war to anybody, so it's money gone unspent at this point. Um, I can I can talk to a few points yeah. on the floor. A couple of them. One, the uh, the funds for this project go into the electric utility capital fund. It's not related to general. tax fund or general fund for the other assets the city owns. Um, there's really different funding silos. Um, for the capital assets for different sections, water, sewer, electric, and public works, and <coughs> facilities in Summerside. So there are different pot of monies that council needs to look at for budgets. The second item on the timing, um, engineering budgets are formally approved end of March. So in the month of April, you need an engineering scope and review to get a hire an engineering firm. They were engaged by the end of May, and then from the end of May to roughly September, by the time you go through iterations of renovations, need, architectural concerns, and everything, it took a while to get the engineering tender set prepared. It was issued in roughly late October, closed in November, and that's why we're here today. Just the way the process goes. That's the type of time frame it takes to develop some of these projects on, on a typical time frame when you have engineering, architectural, and the needs, and review along the way, about four or five reviews of those sets. You have to coordinate operational needs with staff and concerns. It's a fairly complicated process, and it takes time. So that's why we're here today to talk about the renovations. Uh, secondly, on the, on the cost and how you'd handle it if you wanted to probably not do the project, then it would be a holdover to next year's budget. So that mo normally what would mean is we would contact the tenderers and say that the city is not proceeding with this tender at this time due to f un insufficient funds and then reissue it in when the budget cycle comes back around. The difference you'd have is you'd hit it on the ground running with the engineering design already done. There might be some legal implications, you might rely on the legal affairs on if there's no change in scope on the tender, how that works for the retendering process, or whether or not the low person bid would have the chance to, you know, submit or have the bid or hold the price until that time. I'm not sure of those processes. Okay, thank you. Um, is it Greg have his light on? No, no, okay. it's not. Right. Greg, it was on there, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, um, okay. okay so, um, so did the investigate investigation is completed on your for your like the engineering? That's all completed, is what you're saying, Greg. And if we decided to to hold that off for another year, we're, we're not committed to that, are we? Is that what you're saying? Like, are we committed to that tender? We haven't actually. No, no, there's no. no, there's no commission. There's no. Kay. Well, I guess Leo can maybe comment on, on the liability of issuing a tender and following through. But right. <laughs> as, as Greg, as Greg has outlined, um, this is all the process so far is all very typical and normal, right? Of right. Approving okay. budget, yeah. and this is exact. Like the process has played out. Okay exactly the way it's supposed to, except the project has come back in $400,000 over, or $300,000 over budget. Um, as Craig has indicated, scaling it over two budget cycles is at, like very normal. We've done it before. Um, it shouldn't affect funding for any general fund projects, i.e. any other capital work at Firehall. This is all within the electric utility. Yeah. Um, 
fairly straightforward. Okay. In, in terms they, of the tender, we can choose not to award the tender. Um, right, because it's no, yeah. Foregone significant amount of work the staff did, and this was a project that came through council, was debated during the budget cycle, and staff were given direction to move forward with it. So. Okay, thank you. So it won't affect um, any decisions, the general fund, any decisions around our fire hall, because that, that to me, I agree, I have to agree with the mayor, that, um, that fire hall is in, it's in rough shape, a uh, rough condition, and it needs some serious consideration. Um, so I guess if one's not, um, you know, conflicting with the other, then I'm. Greg's always very reluctant to say this, but you do. I think it's important to recognize too that the electric utility, through a number of different means, funds you know, close to 30 percent of the rest of the operations, right? So it's yes. in, a, in a large. Something to keep in mind is that that uh, you have to look after the golden goose. Right? Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of golden gooses. That's the problem. <laughs> golden geese. <laughs> if I could just comment on that Thank other you. to you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And that other 300,000 that it's over budget, is that what's the exact number, dollar? I think Gordon had mentioned uh, 400,000 over budget. So I think that's got to be kept in mind too. But that'll be out of the electrical budget, right? That the, the, the 400,000 for next year will still be into the electrical budget right? yeah, so instead of the general fund, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so the normal procedure when we develop a capital plan for the years yeah. that comes forward to council, we try to consider and talk with finance and CAO yeah. and the group to keep it within the financial plans of the city in any year. Now, sometimes there's extraordinary circumstances that might come towards council that need attention sooner than later, but there's usually a predetermined level of capital requests that come in for the utility, and we try to keep it within those levels. But if the city wants to purchase electric vehicles, for example, or set of traffic lights are a couple of hundred thousand dollars maybe now. So when we get into the budget discussions, could we be told because of this that the electrical vehicles uh, won't be purchased this year or the set of traffic lights for whatever intersection, the dollars are not there because we took the three or four hundred thousand and put it into this. I'm just trying to get everything out on the table. Sure, only as it pertains to the electric utility capital planning. So traffic lights usually are come through public works or through technical services planning, so that's usually not a consideration of the electric utilities planning. The electric utilities planning mainly is about trucks and equipment, distribution lines, transformers, things to do with exactly with the electric utility is, is what the capital plan for that silo is. They usually, we don't, as staff, we don't consider the impact of that plan with other sections of the city what we try to do is make sure we stay within the plan of the financial requirements of the electric utility and what it can sustain operationally. It's a little different silo. Greg? Well, yeah, I... Senior accountant. I think one of the reasons why... I, I'm confused over this fire hall. There, there isn't any uh, 30 cent dollars or anything is available. There's no programs available for it. We've had... Uh, Firemen, I have four or five close friends that I meet with every week, and uh, our last gentleman that sat there, our last counselor, Mr. Garage, was on the fire department. We have another fireman over there. I've never had any of them ever request a new fire hall, or they all say it's a, it's a want, not a need. That's the exact words that I get. It's a want, not a need. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's obvious sometime there has to be a a new fire hall, but it's certainly is not a very good time for it. And, and I know the amount of government money that their fire or electoral commission is going to be bringing in in the next few years in some of our projects. And uh, we're known all across Canada because of our electoral department. It would certainly be nice to to have a, a nice office and stuff when we're, we're getting the help from the other governments. But I, it really confuses me when the firemen always tell me it's a want, not a need. I've heard that a thousand times. Brian or Norma, whoever was first. Um, <clears throat> I guess I just listening to what you've presented, Director Greg. Um, 
i feel that what you're presenting is is a very important need for the building because of the utility, because of all of the you know ah how it feeds other different departments and the community. and i see that's very, very important. and um where it's coming out of the utility, the electric utility, that funding you know would be helpful for that. Um, on the other side of the equation, I guess back last year, we weren't aware of what we were going to run into with the Summerside Fire Hall and with Hurricane Dorian, a lot of things things surfaced where we did realize that there was a greater need than we anticipated. And looking at that as a picture for the overall community, similar to the utility and, and the office for the utility, electric utility, there is a big need there. So I guess what I'm wondering what you folks are saying, I see that as being important. We have to look at the $400,000 over budget, where that's going to come from and how we can you know, look at that. But I also feel that this year, one of the serious things that we really need to earmark is the fire hall, because contrary to what may or may be said, um, that is the one building that we're pretty dependent on in emergencies. So I think there will be some pretty strong debate on that. but. I do appreciate everything that you've said as, as far as the needs and the costing. Brian? Yeah, I guess there are three or four points here. I don't know if any of them make any sense, but anyways. Um, <laughs> so if I'm understanding correctly, it's paid for out of the utility. It's not paid out of the general fund. So it's really right. not a, uh, you know, one versus the other in that case. Um, I guess, what hasn't been talked about is, you know, what's the cost of not doing it? Because certainly, I had a very thorough tour of that building last winter, one day with you, Greg, and I mean, it is, particularly when you th look at what, you know, the advancements around the technology and all that kind of stuff that's happened in, in the life of that building, and to be able to house the stuff that's required now compared to, you know, even, 10 years ago, probably. Um, so, you know, uh, I wonder about, uh, you know, the additional 400,000 um, in spreading it over two years. I think the important thing is if it can be, if it can be managed within the utility without causing a rate increase, um, then something I, I could support, I think, going forward, because I think it's badly needed. And if I'm hearing correctly, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's it's being funded mm -hmm. through two different sources. So I think it's a it's a, that's a different debate uh, on on the fire hall. So um, I, I think it's something that we probably need to do sooner rather than later. And it's not going to be uh, any cheaper in five or ten years' time. In fact, it's going to cost significantly more. Um, now is probably the best time to get it done if we can do it without a rate increase would be the mm -hmm. concern for me. Justin? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just to, I guess, address, just, I know that this isn't a fire hall item or meeting, um, but just um, to, I guess, respond to a couple of, of points. Um, something that sort of makes the fire hall a little different is that, and I, I guess I'm kind of speaking as a firefighter, we don't work out of that building. We're not there. We don't see it daily. And I think because of that, um, we tend to not really think about it until we're there or until a, a hurricane event happens. Um, and Greg, you're, you're right. Um, there's not a lot of um, we need this, we need this, we need this over there. There isn't. Um, until something like the hurricane happens and, and we're in the building. Um, whether or not we need a new fire hall or not is, is probably something that nobody in this room can, can decide. We, we really need to heavily consult with uh, the chief and his deputies. And, um, but that being said, there's a, there's a roster of tradesmen over there. Um, and when it comes to the roof and, and, and little things like that, there's no reason why some of us can't get to work and do some of that. Um, I think a new fire hall is certainly a want, uh, not a need at this point, but there's some repairs over there that are that are mm -hmm. absolute needs. And like I said, we don't really realize that they're there because we're not in the building. 
until we are in the building and, and only then it's evident that something needs to be done like especially with the roof and everything but um, just to respond to that I agree there's 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 nobody coming to any of us begging for it that we need it but um, there are some things over there that are needed uh, like I said this isn't a this is a <laughs> <laughs> Director Greg's there like, this is an electric meeting, what are you talking about? Um, just just wanted to <coughs> grab a couple of those points and, and just throw them out there. Thank one. you. Thank you. Okay. And then I, I just have one and then I'll be done. I just want to, um, being the chair of fire services, um, I, I do hear that there is a need and it's not a want um, from the chief and, and um, definitely not a want. Um, the roof blew off two separate times here in the last year. Um, so I think we need to tour that building as a council and then and then make a decision. I think that will help us all out. I, I've gotten to do that and it's uh, it's not very pretty over there. Anyway, thank you. Bob, and just to, I'm just, sorry. It's another one of the key, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say that I agree. It's maybe, I, it sounded like maybe you're disagreeing with what I said, but I agree with a brand new fire hall is not a need. And I think we're on the same page, but when you're discussing the roof and the leaks, 100%, that something needs to be done there. I, I think we're on the same page, you and I, but it kind of came across as that we weren't. I just want to clarify that. Uh, I just want to make a couple of distinctions between when we're setting up uh, Greg's renovation with the, with the fire hall. One is his has long been in a state of readiness and preparation and assessment and engineering and everything else so he's he's ready to go get out of the gate there hasn't been that kind of formal evaluation assessment uh, with the fire hall uh, it needs to be done and the other distinction is that we've got new management at the fire hall fresh ideas fresh perspectives and uh, some new ideas on on how uh, existing renovations may be able to extend not existing res, re, uh, renovations but uh, potential res, renovations that may well extend the useful life of that fire hall that will also require uh, some investigation and study what can we do we've got the property next door that may be a possibility for you know uh, expansion I don't know but the thing is it's a big X factor now uh, and until we know all the details and add them all up, uh, we don't really, we're not really in that state of readiness to, to go ahead with that. However, council during the next budget cycle can make that a priority over the next couple of years. Corey, no. uh, oh, I'm sorry. Just, just a couple quick points. I, I think it's ironic that we're sitting here talking about electric utility and then we're right into the fire. So I, I think it's, that shows the importance of it uh, from a council perspective that we ultimately go right to that when we're spending money and we're thinking, oh, well, we really need to do something with the fire hall, whether or not it's a renovation or retrofit or whatever. Uh, second point, I'm not one bit surprised that the firefighters are not saying we really need this. Like, they're sort of like heroes of mine. They run into buildings burning. Like, it's, it's amazing what they do. I couldn't do it. So I'm not one bit surprised that we're not hearing that from them. They just, as long as they have their fire truck and their suits and safety gear, I'm pretty sure they'll work out or whatever. But so I just want to make that point. Norman. And mine will just be short. Um, I just want to go back probably two councils back. I believe there was a study done on the fire department uh, that did bring some uh, formal information on the state of the fire department or the there, fire hall. There, there was a, a basic strategic plan for that and the, the plan was number one to find us a, a suitable site a new site uh, because they did have a study done on the uh, uh, servicing times that they could they could uh, achieve where they are versus where they ideally ought to be and that location is not was not the optimal location the old location it was further further north so that was one aspect uh, the other one was that a functional plan was done for a new fire hall and a functional plan is basically just a laundry list of needs for space requirements 
for vehicles, uh, bunker gear, uh, you know, washrooms, recreation facilities, tools, all those kinds of things. And that was completed. Mm -hmm. uh, now that's pre-designed, that's before we get to any design. So there is a, we do have a document that does kind of rough out <coughs> the basic needs of a fire department of our size. However, it was left at that, that I mean, we're looking at a, a project that's that's pretty big, like you're looking at eight, 10, 12 million dollars uh, with what we'd started with. Oh, and the other thing that was uh, attempted, but we, we couldn't get further because uh, we didn't have the funding at the time and there was quite a search for funding at the time and it just wasn't available through federal or provincial means and uh, there was an attempt to try to amalgamate or co-occupy uh, emergency services, the ambulance services, because they were looking for space at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, they had to move ahead with, uh, with their plans uh, because we weren't ready at the time. And I appreciate you saying that, CAO Bob. I guess I just want to make sure in the minutes that it was noted that there was a, you know, a study done and um, there certainly has been a lot of debate on it, and I realize we're in an electric tech service utility. Right. I'll just sum up there, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're talking renovations versus brand new. I think it sort of wandered from the renovations into a brand new facility. I remember the police station was built in 74, and uh, 20 years later, it had to be modernized and renovated, or 25 years later, whenever it was, Chief, do you remember? For 25 years, it had to be renovated. And here's a building that was built in, I think, 1959 or 60, with no renovations. Uh, so uh, rather than this new talk, it could be completely renovated to have it modernized and suitable for today yeah. uh, with some extra. So I, I, I just don't think it's, we should shove it to one side. I mean, we're talking renovating the Army building, built in 1911, you know? so. Uh, but for some reason or other, the fire hall seems to always get shoved aside for whatever reason. And maybe they're good reasons, I don't know. But um, that facility over there, I had a tour there fire prevention week. And, uh, and I'm going to arrange for all council to see the downstairs part of it, the upstairs part of it, yeah. and, and even the main floor. I mean, there's not enough room in there to change your mind when the trucks are in there, sort of thing. So anyway, I, I strongly feel, and I'm not a firefighter, but I, I, I've visited a lot of firehouses over the years, and uh, that certainly needs some work. And let's not shove it aside for everything else all the time. And we have, you know, our, our recreation facilities are great, and our police station facilities are great, and the other electrical buildings are great, and the city hall got renovated, and I think the city made the right decision 20 years ago, whenever it was. I think they both did the police station and the fire hall going, or, or the police station and city hall going at the same time. So. Uh, that's just my thoughts on it. I, I would hope that uh, there's enough support to get it modernized and uh, and or whatever, because it, in my opinion, it's if the Department of Health went in there in the basement right now, I don't think the toilets have been flushed for years. And you know, it just to have a look at it when you go in sometime in a few weeks, whenever we can arrange it. Anyway, that's my thought on it, uh, and I understand fully how important the electrical utility is. But uh, let's not forget about uh, another facility that hasn't been touched since 1959, or whatever the year is, I just forget. Thank you. Perfect. Mr. Chairman. Greg? Just, just may offer some advice to council from staff, is that this building has been a process of, well, it's going on its fourth year now. Right. So just to give you an idea of how the what, effort it takes to start this stuff. What, what building? Is that fourth year, this for the electric service building. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in 2016, there was uh, some catastrophes with the bathrooms and smells and so forth. Yeah. So we started investigating the causes of those. We had HVAC systems were antiquated. So we started looking at the building and said, you know, we walk by it every day, much like the fire services people, you're in there every day, and sometimes you just don't notice things. Right. And after a while, we said, okay, staff are starting to complain. It's becoming, you know, an issue. So we, we got in and said, well, there's only one way to do this. The first thing is do a professional assessment of the building and is it warranted? What could we do for small renovations versus large renovations versus what do we need to do to get the building up to snuff to occupy in today's occupational health and safety world? So 
once we completed that there was an assessment that came out that said yeah you're in dire need of some upgrades so we looked at the size of the upgrades and we looked at building new buildings and things but we decided to with the effort required to renovate at the same time when we renovated we broke it up into two components which was the exterior cladding and then the interior fit up for the for the renovations and that was one way to soften the blow for budget considerations for council with all the needs and requests so and then once we did that we went in and we did the exterior cladding one year with fully extension due to renovations the second year the only issue we got surprised with was the rise in construction costs which brings us back in front of you on that plan now in a very similar process the fire hall could be looked at in a two or three or four year stage process where you actually start doing different components as long as it's planned properly I think you might be able to soften the budget blow and still progress your issues in the community. Right. Just my advice. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so now that we're back on municipal works uh, and we put out all the fires, I'd just like to say that uh, it was a good discussion to have the fire involved in this because I know it's a topic uh, that will probably come up at uh, budgets. and. Uh, I go back to you know the conversation is it a want or a need uh, regardless whether it's a want or a need something has to be done with the fire hall I think we all can agree with that I just get start shaking when I hear the word new so uh, but whether you talk about want or a need this is a need it's not a want and I think that we need to push ahead with this and support our golden goose of the city uh, because they, uh, they, they need a, a good place to work. They, you have the uh, top quality people working in uh, not so great premises. You don't get the work out of them. You put them in a new facility with, with uh, or not a new facility, but a renovated facility with, uh, you know, modern uh, surroundings, you're going to get more productive work out of them, and I hope that we all can support this move it forward so with that do I do we need a motion to move it for the monthly meeting uh, yeah a motion to uh, I'll move that uh, a motion that we uh, move this project to uh, the council meeting on December the third 16th yeah so. second okay all in favor signify by saying aye Janae, motion carried. Thank you, Greg. Good conversation, though. Thank you. Who's next? The next committee is Police Services. Councillor Barb Ramsey and Chief Poirier is taking the, the hot seat. One way or he could take either way. Yeah. Welcome, Chief uh, Poirier. I'd like to call a police services meeting um, to order. Um, so what we have on the agenda this evening is uh, the first thing we have. We had two items, and uh, first one is taxi bylaw um, review. I'm getting a number of complaints as well as Councillor Corey. I don't know if anyone else is or no one else has spoken to me about it regarding the bylaws that are now in place. Um, regarding uh, the taxis so we have a couple three gentlemen here uh, this evening from uh, welcome gentlemen from United Taxi and um, so I guess what I'll do is um, kind of give it to uh, Chief Poirier or have would the gentleman who would we how would we process this first get some of the gentlemen to get up and speak regarding their concerns I, I don't mind speaking to what and you can here? speak to yours as uh, well. So okay, go ahead, so Corey. I've, I've had an, uh, one particular taxi driver who's a constituent of mine reach out to me. Uh, I felt like it was probably some questions from the stand overall. That's what I sort of felt it is. And just a number of questions just asking about uh, our current bylaws. Right. They haven't been looked at in a while. Uh, a feeling that maybe uh, some of the newer taxis that are in town aren't really following 
bylaw as intended or are there some gray area in there and maybe some people trying to skirt some of the issues that are in the bylaw. Um, they, the basic request that I got from it was, you know, can you guys look at it? You know, it has been reviewed since I think, or changed since 2002. I did inform them that we're actually going through that process of now of the taxi bylaw and we're looking into uh, the bylaw as it stands now and possible changes to it in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, there was another concern that was brought forward, um, just that uh, maybe that a taxi company was using meters and indirectly overcharging ratepayers or customers that uh, would be a issue because my understanding is we have set rates. And, uh, so, so just a concern maybe that uh, not all taxi companies drivers are playing on the same playing level and uh, want to make sure that we take a look at it and realize their concern. So uh, CAO Bob has uh, tasked uh, Gordon and I to look at this in January, starting to uh, revamp the, uh, the bylaw, the taxi bylaw. And for your information, uh, we have, haven't received any complaints about people overcharging. And the way the rates go now is, uh, for an adult, one person maximum is $11 in the city. And for seniors, 1050. Uh, whether or not the meters, I don't know if anybody's installed meters or not. Uh, the bylaw doesn't uh, reflect the use of meters. And I don't know if we can stop them from using meters as long as they don't overcharge. And uh, just so everyone knows, we have approximately 70 drivers in the city that are registered. Uh, some only drive seasonal. Uh, some take time off to work the potato industry. Uh, some take time off in the winter. Most drivers do drive in the summer. How many but taxi cars do we have? You know, I don't have that number, Your Worship, but uh, sometimes uh, the might be two or three drivers assigned to one car. One could work day shift, one work night shift. So uh, I'm taking a guess at so 30 to 35 uh, probably vehicles. Are you say 70 licensed, 70 licensed drivers? Drivers, yes, yes correct. Yes, okay. Um, so I think one, one thing that staff are looking for this evening, um, I guess is, and I'm not sure we've ever gotten the official direction from council or committee to, to bring anything back, but we have, <coughs> staff had, have started to have some internal discussions around the bylaw. It is fairly antiquated. It hasn't been, hasn't been amended at least, uh, since 2002, um, doesn't necessarily mean it hasn't been reviewed, but it hasn't been amended, um. I think some initial feelings are that there's um, potentially the way that the way that the taxi business and more specifically, which is a different business, the ride sharing business is evolving. Um, that our bylaw uh, potentially may be too um, uh, not onerous, but it may have too much regulation for just the way that this business has evolved. Um, over the last kind of 10 years. Um, so uh, if, if it's this committee's wish, then staff will bring back a, um, a revised bylaw for review at the January, yeah, at the January police committee meeting. Um, and, and our thought right now with that, it would be a, a, a bylaw with a more narrow focus on exactly what the municipal government kind of should be regulating and maybe some areas that there's not a need for us to regulate anymore. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Kerry. Um, oh, go ahead. I don't, sorry. Um, this is something that was brought to my attention last year. I actually sat with the gentleman and we, uh, for about, I was there for an hour or so, and I think when you're going to be looking at changing the bylaws, you have to look at the people that are running the system. There's complaints about drivers using Bluetooth, um, but then when you sit with this gentleman and you see the hundreds of calls that come in, 
i don't understand how it could be safe to be using a bluetooth system and taking all the notes that this gentleman had to take also we have an issue in our bylaw where it says you have to have a stand and not all taxi operations right now that i'm aware of have a stand where you have to have a bathroom and so on so i really think that if we're going to take this to committee um, by the policy review that we need to get people in that work in i understand that our residents are they have very um, viable complaints and issues some of them but we also need to get them all around the table and find out who's doing what before us who don't work in the system make the laws so right. okay. thank you Carrie. Uh, yes uh, and just to add to Carrie's point this was an item and we had talked to Joe and the uh, guys down there uh, and it was supposed to be on the policy review just before the last council finished it was directed for the council uh, for the policy review and and uh, we said we'd be in touch with the, the taxi uh, owners or operators to have input so I uh, kind of disappointed that it's this long but we need to address this now I think and and uh, get the ball rolling because I've never seen so many taxis in this city I I I don't know how many cars are here. How many did you say? There, yeah. Whether I don't know where they're coming from, but there, there's an awful lot. Um, I don't have the exact number. I have the, the drivers. I don't have the cars, but there's probably 35 before we get the most. Is that normal? I think it's been that way for a long while. Well, they must all just got signs on top of the roof then, because <laughs> every second car you meet's got a sign on top of it. So well, anyway. anyway. That kind of begs the question of the larger picture of how as a municipality you do want to or don't want to regulate ride sharing, yeah. right? Because under our current bylaw, somebody could open up a, and I'll use the term Uber because that's one most people are familiar with, but there's no, we have no municipal regulations that would outlaw, Uber. that's not a great word to use, but that would, that would disallow Uber from operating in Summerside today. So in other jurisdictions, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of debate and discussion between the, the taxi industry and, and online rides, ride sharing services, and, and um, I don't think it's any secret that's been contentious in a lot of other municipalities. But yeah. as our rules stand today, there's nothing that stops that. So kind of the big picture that I think council has to turn their mind to is: do we want to regulate? Or, or just how in depth do we want to regulate? Historically, we've been down into the minutia of you need to have a bathroom, you need to do this, you need to do that, right? That's one approach, and arguably, to regulate that way may place burdens on an industry that another type of industry is not going to face, right? Right. So, the staff's initial thoughts have been to try to streamline the approach so that the taxi industry isn't facing any extra hurdles that we aren't kind of placing on other enterprises in the city. Um, the industry may think that's a good idea, they may think yeah. that's a poor idea, and the Councillor Adams' yeah. point, that's, it's a good idea to bring them into that conversation, but... Um, no, I, I, I agree, but I, Thank you I guess, yeah, I guess uh, just to go back, uh, that it was the previous council that it was on, and then I believe Councillor uh, Adams brought it forward early in our new yep. in our new mandate. So I, I think you know we we need to set down with the industry now and, and develop something. So I guess that's a question that we need to answer. How does I know we're in council me or committee meetings, but how does this? How, where are we? We're in police committee. How does How police do committee want to handle it? Do you want us to bring something back to bylaw and policy review? Do you want us to bring something back to police committee? We'll do whichever, whichever we want. But okay, so we can have that discussion as just as soon as we finish hearing. Um, Norma, go ahead. Um, I've received uh, 
a number of just you know comments or points that were made and i and i sent them to our cao for his awareness but um with regards to taxi services uh people are wondering about the uh you know maybe a, say taxis operating in a residential area what i have heard from residents is what their concern is is that it it's in an in a residential area in an area where it's congested there's you know buses down back and forth on, on that street area and i think there's some concern that they weren't aware that this the service was operating so i just wanted to bring that forward if the the bylaws being reviewed or looked at and i think that the biggest comment is around privacy quality of life if there's parking spaces that are being taken up on the street or not in an area if, about signage those kinds of things that they weren't aware of when it begun and now they're wondering it's it's in a residential area so they would like to have that checked in the bylaw thank you norma thank you. and uh Mayor. Sorry, oh. is there specifics on, is that like a taxi stand operating in a residential area? Uh, I, I believe it's uh, been operating mm -hmm. maybe probably for s several years from what I understand. But are, we, are we talking about the taxi stand that's operating at or the hotel? Or are they driving? Or are we well, what, what I was told is that there's no signage or whatnot on the property, but there's definitely signage on the vehicles, which it would be united. So that's, they did want to have that just checked. And they're not against business. They're not, you know, but it's just kind of one of those things that they would like to have checked in the bylaw. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Basil? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, Councillor Adams uh, has the same point that I was going to make there, but I think it's very important that you contact all taxi companies and and drivers will have good suggestions like uh, what could be in the taxi bylaw and if it's uh, updated or, or looked at. And it might be a good idea to go to some other municipalities our size from around Atlantic Canada for suggestions or thoughts to see what they may have in it. But, but uh, I agree, it, it, there's nothing wrong with having a look at the bylaw, but we don't want to come in with some regulations that you know, that ties the hands of taxi drivers and operators to make a living. And uh, mm -hmm. realizing we're in a different era now than we were 40 years ago. So, uh, and I like the idea of bringing back the policy review committee to talk about it and, and keep the taxi stands advised of the possibilities or, and get their suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. Um, I know the, um, the gentlemen that are here this evening, um, contacted me there um, maybe 10 days ago or so or two weeks ago and and we got this on the agenda for this evening and and I know it's their livelihood and I know they have some real concerns about what's been taking place here in Summerside and I guess what I say to you gentlemen now it's it's your opportunity to speak if you would like to do that um, if you do just go to the mic and state your name and um, your address and uh, go ahead and speak. Uh, thank you, Your Worship and the City Councilors. My name is Miles Dusat. I live at Cameron Avenue in Woodridge Trailer Park. I've been in the business for about 37 years with United Taxi. Um, I just have one issue here. It's a section, uh, what is it, number 16 section, section uh, B. The taxi stand owner shall keep the premises in good repair, neat, clean, accessible to the public, washroom facilities, and should be open to the public during hours of operation. Now for the safety of the citizens of Summerside, it would be best if you're coming from a facility at night, and you walk outside of the facility, and you look for a cab and there's none there. So you say, well, there's a stand right around the corner. So walk around the corner, and that facility is closed. Wrap the door, it's not open. Well, what am I going to do? So I'm going to have a cigarette and wait for a cab. None comes. I walk around the corner, back to the facility. I was at. Still nobody there. So I walk back over to the stand, hoping that somebody shows up. Nobody. But I see my car up in the parking lot. I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. I'm getting disgusted. I jump in that car. I know I shouldn't do it, but if the stand was open, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be jumping in my car. So I jump in my car, and I drive home. 
smoke my cigarette, I drop it, I go bend over, UFO is with me, I hit something. So I'm not sure if the city's going to be liable for a suit for not enforcing this bylaw or the owner of the taxi stand. I'm sure uh, for the safety of the citizens of Summerside, especially during the, the club hours, those facilities should be open for the safety, not just for the safety of the person coming from the club, but also for the citizens of Summerside where an accident is going to happen. I would also like the city to get back into taking control of the fares in Summerside, as Dave was talking about it there. Mr. Poirier, uh, he was talking about the fares. I would really like the city to get back on board and take control of them for the citizens of Summerside so they don't know from one day to the next when they jump in the fare, uh, jump in the car, what the fares are going to be. I could jump in a cab and I'm having a great day. How much is it going to cost me? I say, no, nah, Dave, I'm having a great day. Give me a buck. The next day, I could take them to the same place. Dave, I'm having a bad day. Give me 11. That's not right. The citizens should, in Summerside, should have a fair idea of what the prices are going to be every time they step into that car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would hope for the citizens of Summerside that the council will, and the city, take over the controlling of the prices in town. Thank you. And I hope to see you in January. Thank you, Miles. Um, the other gentleman, is there any, you know, this is your time to speak. If you have some concerns, now's the time to do it. in the bylaw that's here it says that you must be open well we know one of the stands and it could be we all could do this I guess they're dispatching out of Moncton when they feel like it that's taking money away from the city I guess in one way because it's not employing something from the city is that legal well, I don't know and as far as what this gentleman said is there any rules against it well I looked up some of the bylaws in Charlottetown, and Uber is illegal to operate Uber out of the city of Charlottetown. It can be a $500 fine if you're not registered with the city of Charlottetown. I just stumbled across that one day when I was checking, just to see what's what's what. And as far as the fares go, from what I understand, the fares went down 10 years ago, and we come up. 50 cents, we went down a dollar, well, 50 cents in 10 years. <coughs> and I would like to see it regulated to, I don't want to see a meter because we already know what the meters are going to cost the, the citizens. It's almost double is what we're hearing. And we don't need to make that kind of money, but we need to be nice to make a little bit. But a lot of people don't even realize how much money cost to operate a taxi place. I, it cost me 30000 a year before I turn a wheel. That's what's, that's only stamina and insurance. That's got nothing to do with fuel, maintenance, whatever. And uh, most of us agree anyway at our stamina. We'd like to have a raise, but we can't raise it when we have other people that hold. Dirty pool is what uh, a lot of them are doing. In the city. We have zones, and they move their zones to make it cheaper for the customer in the zone. But I mean, those zones we've been using for years, they know the zones. All the taxi drivers in the city probably have to work for Courtesy Cab or United at one time or another, or some are just new. Other than that, I can't okay. think of a whole lot, but I'm sure I can when I leave here. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be nice if you guys could look at it and maybe regulate it. I don't know, Charlton, they're regulating their prices. We have guys that left here that went to Charlton because there's more money in Charlton. And we're not looking for a big raise, but it'd be nice to get some to help us out. Because we do do a lot for city with the elderly and the uh, handicapped, the uh, blind people, I mean, we help them out. Come up with us, come for a drive someday and they'll see. Hmm. <coughs> exactly what we do do. But anyway, that's what all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Blaine. Um, so is that it? Would you, yeah. 
in the taxi business 30 years in Toronto and 20 years here. And when I started here, it was somehow regulated and it was, we used to come to meetings and everything was going good. And then one meeting, they put an amendment in and they just weren't going to look after the taxi business anymore. Well, Councillor Corey, you said about the fares, what, 10.50 and 9.50? We charge $5 and 5.50. That's all we're charging. We haven't had a raise since 2011. Anybody else haven't had a raise since 2011? I just own one car and the other guys, my guys are all independent. They pay their, their taxi stand on Monday morning. We have uh, 15 cars and we're just breaking even because we have to pay dispatchers 24 hours a day. Our dispatchers are there with our offices open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sunday morning I was driving. This guy walks up to our stand, he said, Oh, it's cold. I just walked over from, uh, what's their name, Air Cab? They're closed. He said, they're closed. I need a ride to go see my mother at the uh, Somerset Manor. So I took them up. It's a $5 call. You know, that's fine. That's what we're charging. But I want you to know that we're not charging no ten fifty and no nine fifty mm -hmm. in Somerset. It's $5 and five fifty, And it's less than it was before 2011. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, it sounds to me like you guys are just looking for equality, right? You just wanted a fair, fair game. Um, and that's, that's not asking very much. Um, I think that um, we'll definitely look for a policy review. Does that sound okay with everybody here at Council? And uh, we would invite some of the um, taxi drivers or owners or to come in and uh, be part of that. Um, Councillor Carey, did you have something? Um, I was just going to say, um, uh, Councillor Duran and myself are on bylaw policy review. So myself, obviously we haven't chatted about it, but um, seeing what I did when I went and worked with you over lunchtime, it, um, I'm not meant it to be there, that's for one, because it was, it was quite hectic. Um, I do believe that it should go to bylaw policy review committee. I believe there should be a rep from police services, um, Chief Poirier, just so that, you know, that area is covered and there's no loopholes there. I think um, we should have a representative from the taxis um, either we can we can work out how we're going to get that mm. done, like one per, and then maybe one per company, and then we can figure out when we all get together how we're going to do this. Um, and I would request that each councillor send in all the complaints that you've had so that we don't miss anything, whether it be big or small, just hearsay. Send it in so that we don't miss anything and that when we do this, we're going to do it right. Yes. Yes. Except, uh, there we go. Except written submissions with suggestions from whomever, and to have those on file to study. And there may be some great suggestions out there. So from the taxi drivers, from the companies, and maybe John Q. Public got a suggestion. So if they could submit things in writing too, then you know where you stand when you have it in writing. Thank you. And just. Uh, <coughs> One thing I think certainly um, if, if residents have made any comments or whatever, I think the hardest thing for them when they come forward is they don't want to cause any problems. They're not against the business. They're, you know, there's nothing like that. But just what I did mention earlier, I'll certainly send that through if that could be checked out in confidence without names. Thank you, everyone. So um, are we looking to do this for January? Is that uh, what people are thinking? Is that sound, we'll is to that too soon to get? We'll have to get all our information together about the yeah. taxi stands. And Again, there's some, there's some preliminary questions that we have to get, a, that we have to get an idea around, right? And, and my thought on that, and it may be different, obviously, than others, and that's how the, part of the process, right? But 
is whether or like big picture whether or not or how much regulation you want to put on the taxi business because and that's well that's a head another whole conversation right I just to, to me that's the, that is the foundational question because if we we can yeah we can fine tune what we have. We can blow up we, what we have and start anew. We can say we're out of the taxi business and let the free market handle the whole thing. We can decide we want to have more ride sharing in the community. We can decide we want to ban ride sharing from the community and try to police that. Like, there are some major foundational questions that if we are thinking of amending our taxi bylaw, which it sound like, let's be honest, there's pieces of our bylaw that we have, I don't want to say turned a blind eye to, but that we have not been able to enforce, you know, uh, and that is causing some people in the industry to say, you know what, like, we're doing this and the other guy's not doing that, and that's fairly fair comment. I think we all agree on that, but before we create the new rules, we got to figure out what the foundation is for what kind of rules we want to create. Okay, council. And to create those rules and get the foundation, we have to find out first what's going on out there. We have to find out from each one of this, one of the companies what they're doing different from the other and then take it back and see where we're going to start because right now it seems like it's sort of a little bit wishy-washy and everybody might be doing their own thing just because we've been a little lenient on it and and again like foundationally part of that comes down to is this a business we want to regulate their hours of operation is this a business we want to regulate whether they have stands open closed whether you take your reservations in person or on your phone or like there's a lot of questions in there right and we may choose that we want to regulate it and I don't mean strictly but regulate it to a great extent like we kind of have historically or we may choose to say you know what the ride sharing business is kind of moving in this direction and maybe we want to let the market dictate more I, you know but that's up to council to decide and, but I think we have to have those discussions so so then let's have a discussion right. so so I guess that I'm suggesting that might be the first discussion that we have in our bylaw policy review with we, uh, staff have had some internal thoughts but that hasn't gone any further yet so so are you talking a discussion with inviting the taxi drivers yeah, in absolutely. that's yeah. Yeah, yeah well I guess yeah that's what I was thinking we would do and then make up some rules or laws or whatever as we kind of get the information I guess that's yeah okay right. so who oh I Bruce just had one yeah. comment uh, am I hearing that the rates are probably the biggest obstacle no okay just one obstacle just just one obstacle no I uh, okay that's good so how do we go from here then who's going to set up that uh, meeting uh, Okay, so I will leave that up to you guys to uh, move forward on that. What's that? At the very least, get an intern report at, at the January committee meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. An update then in, in January. All right. All right. So, um, thank you. And the next thing on the police. Uh, um, meeting is the winter parking ban and I believe that is Councillor Snow and maybe Deputy Mayor yeah it, it was uh, it was totally Councillor Snow and it just happened that uh, there was an email came in today uh, through Councillor McCollman on the exact same thing which was kind of ironic uh, I, gu I guess the reason why I brought this is twofold it is now turning cold and snowy and uh, so forth um, but uh, for a number of years being a car driver it's something I've often thought about uh, re there's been recent stuff uh, in the news from Charlottetown regarding their uh, winter band and the way other municipalities handle their winter parking ban uh, we live in an older city with some older areas uh, mine being one of them uh, Councilor Coleman's uh, that's why she had got the email that uh, a lot of the residents in our city uh, have smaller driveways, smaller parking areas. And for some reason, uh, it has been determined over the year that the onus would be 
solely on the homeowners to not park on the street ever from a specific period to another period of time that being said during that period of time there could be absolutely zero weather events possibly large stretches where there is no need for to have a parking ban in other communities the municipal works would issue you know parking ban tonight where you know there's going to be snow removal snow is coming the onus then does switch to the vehicle owner personally when I look at it and I'm open to being convinced otherwise but personally when I look at it I think especially with an older city a lot of smaller driveways it's a very logical way to go our municipal works know very well when they're going to salt when they're going to clear snow if there's a large amount they know the next time they're going to clear snow they know if snow is coming our weather forecasting is getting pretty good around the world sometimes it's not always accurate but I think it's a logical way to move forward and not put so much burden on our residents to you know find parking when maybe otherwise there's no need to if for example recently I got a parking warning on my vehicle but I never thought anything of it it was a beautiful day I pulled it out on the street I have ample parking at my house but during the whole year I sometimes park on the shoulder road but I pulled on the shoulder went in start watching TV went to bed it was a beautiful night out there was no need to even consider it so so I just I think it's I think it's a little bit unfair just to say okay now you can't park on the street winters here and so I just wanted to sort of start the discussion I thought it was a valuable discussion I talked to a former counselor and and asked them what they thought of it as I was preparing to bring it forward and they said you know what it makes a lot of sense to me that the onus really shouldn't be on the residents of Summerside more so us as a city to say okay tonight there's a parking ban of course then the onus is on them I know recently in Charlottetown with the last snow event we had there was I think 80 parking tickets issued and a few vehicles towed I don't I don't feel bad for those residents at that point it was very open knowledgeable that there was going to be a weather system so yes make arrangements but to make arrangements for a six-month period can be very hard on some residents so I just want to sort of open discussion see where it was at and see what appetite among council thank you councillor snow deputy mayor and I guess that's basically the same reason why I sent in the residents email to CAO Bob and actually he he was invited but I had him down for the January committee meeting not realizing it would be discussed tonight but he is aware of some of these points that I'm going to make from CAO that in that suggestion that there had to be some you know like to give fairness to have the discussion because of the suggestion that he made but also that we need to understand the implications and the costs involved in making that type of a change so that when we're discussing it as a council so it's just not really simple and straightforward is what I understand but what would be involved would be linking the parking and any bans around weather forecasts whether they're accurate or not accurate as well as the changes in the plowing operations and police and enforcement when people are on duty you know to monitor those types of things for overnight parking or whatnot especially when it is a winter ban and also the cleanups following that type of a situation if there is any violations but as I did promise to the resident that it would be brought up for discussion but it was just you know that their idea was you know having a small driveway if there's not going to be any snow or bad weather in the forecast would that be something that the city would ever consider in that in that ban thank you councillor Coleman deputy mayor I think you were next right yeah I think I appreciate the concern that's being raised certainly in you know many many nights when there's no no snow in the forest forecast but there's 
there's also salting operations going on and sidewalk salting operations going on and many of those nights where there's no snow and i don't think we really understand the impact um, i really think we should get public works staff to kind of look at the whole thing and bring back some kind of a recommendation um, I, I, I think you know there's valid points being raised that there's lots of nights no reason you shouldn't be able to leave your car out there but there's maybe a lot of things happening in the night that we're not aware of um, uh, because many of the nights that uh, there's no snow clearing going on they're out salting and uh, uh, you know cars parked along the sidewalk and impact the salting operations on sidewalks and those types of things so I just think we should get staff the professional people's opinion on this before before we go too far down the road uh, in affecting the change. Thank you, Brian. Bruce? Well, mine's going to be very short. Uh, I agree with Councillor McFeely. It's basically what I was going to say, so I'll say ditto. <laughs> thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, Mayor Stewart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out today exactly what they were talking about there in, in regards to that. and. Uh, but, uh, you know, how do you police it? Number one, if you decide to change it, you know, if it's going to snow tonight four centimeters, you can park, but if it's five centimeters, you can't park. Who's going to measure the snow? And it just, I could see it turned into a can of worms to try to control it, uh, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, uh, I think, too, if it's a fine night, the police usually use common sense and probably the odd warning or something. But Brian and McFeely and, and that is a good comment, a good suggestion in regards, in regards to sidewalks and salting and those kinds of things. So I don't know how you could control it by changing it too much. I, and I understand uh, I've got my overnight parking tickets too, and I would say it was my fault because I forgot the car on the street when it probably snowed. But if it starts to snow at 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, it's abandoned until 6 or 5 o'clock, it's just so many. Uh, things to try to control it. I think the system you have in place now works fairly well. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. Um, Chief? Yeah, just like a, a couple of things. Our parking ban uh, starts uh, uh, from uh, November the 1st till April 30th, so six months. Uh, ours is from 1 to 6 a.m. Cheryl Town's from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, another issue is if we wait until there's a snow forecast, say there's 50 cars parked in the street and we can't get to them. We have something, an emergency going on somewhere else and the power operators get pretty frustrated when the cars are in the way. And if we wait and issue the parking tickets, you know, when there's snow coming, then you can end up with 100 cars in the street, who knows? Uh, this has been on the books for four or five decades and there's nothing has come through me, any complaints come through me, but uh, and we'll see what council wants to do. In this regard, whether they want to change the bylaw, uh, as long as it's in the bylaw, we're going to continue to monitor it and, and go what the bylaw says. Thank you, uh, Chief Poirier. Um, yeah. Councillor Snow. I, I guess just a couple quick points. I, I totally agree with Councillor McFeely and, and uh, Councillor Bruce that, of course, we involve the municipal works, but I, I think we're selling them a little bit short if we don't really believe that they know that they're going out to snow clear tonight earlier today they have a really good understanding of when they're going to snow clear and if it starts snowing at four o'clock in the morning they have a really good understanding that it's going to start four o'clock in the morning i don't think we have somebody standing up all night saying okay it starts to snow now let's get out on the street so uh it, we we have a good idea of when we're coming into work doing work and if they're salting whenever same thing it works in charlottetown um the onus is what what i'm seeing is the onus is put on our residents the negative impact where really I, I believe the burden should be on the city to say you know what tonight we are going to do some work on the streets tonight we are and then it falls on me then it's my responsibility to for example in Charlottetown I'm just using Charlottetown but I'm sure it's not the only one but it's the one that I'm most familiar with they have an alert system that if you I was to park on the street normally I can register to be on that alert system it comes out that tonight there's snow clearing it comes out to my cell phone or email however you want to set it up and away you go I, I don't think we have 
we're going to end up with a situation where there's going to be nothing that carries fires down the street and people stuck there. And I, I don't think it, I, I think uh, our staff are amazing. So I, I, I really think that they would be able to handle this very well and it would turn the onus off the uh, homeowners. And, and I think as a council and as a city, that's what we should always be striving for is trying to find ways to make it easier for our residents. And, and we do have a lot of houses that have uh, small driveways and they can't park two vehicles. And I think if maybe we, they'd not complain initially to the police services, but that doesn't mean it's not an issue for some. Um, it, it really was ironic that that email uh, came in today to Councillor Coleman. I, I don't know the person <laughs> that sent it, but I, I thought it was sort of funny that it would it come in today with it being on the agenda tonight. So it is an issue around and, and just in talking, usually when I bring up uh, anything to council, I, I make sure I talk to some people prior to some residents and get some feedback on whether it's a, you know, a ridiculous idea or, you know, if that's not a bad idea. So I, I want to open the discussion. I want to bring back, uh, I guess, get our departments thinking on how it could work if it is a possibility and how it does affect our city. And may, maybe it's not a possibility, but to say we've had it on the books for 40 years is, I mean, sure, we've had, there's lots of things that's been around for a long time. It doesn't mean it's the right thing that we continue to do it. So I think that's, that's also. So is this, I guess. I Thank you. Madam Chair, is this something that police committee wants a report back in the new year on? I, I mean, we can, staff can take a look at it and, and try to evaluate the pros and cons and bring a report back to police committee. Um, Definitely, I think. I think, I, I, I think it's worth investigating for sure. I, I definitely think the municipal works needs to be the one of the main factors in this because it, it's them that's going to be affected uh, well, an awful lot as well yeah. as the police. But uh, you know, we, we're we're not just talking about giving somebody a signal that there's snow coming tonight. It's when the snow comes and we have a couple of days of cleanup. When do they think they can park on the street? And when do they? so there's a lot to think about, and uh, but it's it's. It's a good discussion. And the note out, I mean, I should say the note out. We had this discussion today, the mayor and I, about the, the, the level of snow clearing in Summerside is exceptional. And uh, Councillor Snow's comment about our staff, they do, they Absolutely. literally, they do an incredible job. Yes. Um, one of the things that helps facilitate that is that we have an over, that we have a blanket overnight parking ban and we don't, I don't want to say burden, but we don't burden that system with decisions that have to be made on a daily basis. The guys know, the police know that if there's a car, they can ticket it. They obviously use their judgment throughout the winter when if it's a crystal clear night, they may not stop and give a ticket, but um, that's not to say it's not an idea that's not worth looking at. And I guess if, if the chairs, if that's the direction, we come back with a report and a recommendation in the new year sometime. Should not go from, from the committee of council to the council meeting then we can vote whether there, there should be work done on it. We don't want to waste the... Well, I mean, that's a great... The council's majority doesn't want to waste the time of the police chief. That's a great procedural question, I guess, and that's why you're, you're all here. Um, and that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So that's why I guess I'm asking the chair, is, is this something that you'd like staff to put resources in to? There are, mm -hmm. There's only a finite number of resources and things we can look at at one time. Mm -hmm. well, at the monthly meeting, if you want to open the floor, and, and like Councillor Campbell said, if Council wants to look at it or leave it the system the way it is, vote on it, and then we'll move on. That sounds like a good idea because it's new information to me as well. So I would need uh, some support from from everybody to to make that decision, uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor. I think we are actually doing tonight what the residents have have asked we've brought it up it's being discussed it hopefully it's going to be in the media it, it's being you know it's on youtube so it has been given a fair discussion uh, a couple of things that that i think that we also need to be very mindful of is the fact that just as director gordon as you've said that um, our municipal services do a fantastic job they work very hard toward that to keep the streets if you compare it to other municipalities we're very top-notch um, i think my concern would be 
about this information being out there, hearing, listening to the residents, but also respecting, you know, the information that's going to come back to us because we don't want to add another layer or another extra layer of doing, you know, the report coming back. It's tying people up when they have other things that they really need mm -hmm. to be doing. And I guess my biggest concern would be it's not for the, the, the people or the residents that would follow any type of uh, a bylaw or a change. It could also be people that will take advantage of it and really maybe go overboard with it and then we're caught in a situation where, you know, do I park or, or the other thing that I'm going to bring up is how sometimes our staff are really uh, treated in very disrespectful manners on the telephone or in person. And I think, you know, we have a responsibility too as council to try to find that, that fine balance, you know, and not complicate the work. So just leave it there. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, um, Councillor Carey. Chief Foyer, can you repeat again what the hours are? Like you had mentioned the ban and the... Uh, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah, from November the 1st to April 30th. November the 1st to April 30th. Another thing we have to keep in mind here too, if we have a storm tonight, it could take three days to clean up downtown, haul the snow away, mm -hmm. the blowers are out at four o'clock in the morning widening the streets. So, you know, <laughs> we have to think of that too. Okay, thank you, uh, Chief Poirier, and thank you, everyone. And so I will then make the suggestion that we move this um, to our council meeting on December 16th. Um, can somebody, yeah, does that sound okay with everyone? The motion would be a council meeting, should be a positive motion, then if you're against it, you vote against it, sort of thing. You you move a motion that we change the bylaw, or we do however, no. what's the first, whatever the procedure okay. would be. So I, I, need to, I need to make one statement here. I, I don't want everybody to think that I'm here pushing this agenda, and I, I, I sort of got that feeling that people are like, what's he talking about here? The, the thing is, I've had a lot of people that have mentioned that, you know what, why can't we park on the street from whatever? And, and when I think of it, I don't have a really good answer to say, well, because it might snow and we might have to clear for three days. Because I know in other municipalities, it works. Maybe it costs them a little bit more. Maybe it is time to, maybe it doesn't affect them one bit. That is why I brought it forward, because we can have a discussion about it to see how it does work. Now, for us just to say, well, let's not spend time on it, fine, I'm fine with that, but that doesn't get to the root of the answer because it's only affecting the people that it's affecting, right? So it, it, there could be a n large num number in my area, uh, Bruce's area, with, uh, some newer buildings. It might not be an issue because they have larger driveways, but we're here to represent all the cities, so that's, that's why I'm bringing it forward as a possible issue to see why or why not it is or not a good idea so that's that's all i just want to make that clear because i didn't want the impression that oh we need to get rid of it because it might be the worst idea ever but every idea should be discussed and brought forward um, councillor corey certainly i don't i know i didn't take it that you were no. you know you were promoting that um i think personally what i find by this kind of a discussion and some information coming back it actually gives us some factual information that we can let our residents know either way and hopefully, you know, they can they can understand the rationale behind whatever is decided. Okay. I, I just, and the reason why I said it, I, I get the feeling that people are like, oh, we don't want to waste the time no. on this. And, and and I understand that because their time is valuable. But if we don't get the information back from, say, Chief Day, Municipal Works, whatever time that is, then it will never change. So you might lose a very good idea or whatever. I just, it, it was more of an information session. You know. It's a so, so yeah, why can't so we just it's give, give uh, direction to l review this, to look at it, and come back with with a recommendation and, and to, that, and that's, to that's police fine. and uh, municipal yeah. boards I, I uh, instead of be, coming back to yeah. a council meeting? Yeah. Recommendation yeah. on a change or not change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's definitely a way forward. Councilor oh, okay. Campbell asked the question on whether you were given that direction or not, right? Yeah. And, and there's a whole bunch of different ways to get information to yeah. the residents too, right? Yeah. One option is to have a discussion with the CAO and, and, and I don't want to say offline, but offline, get the rationale for why we do what we do the way we do it today. 
and communicate that back to the residents too, right? Like, I'm sure between the chief and I, we can give you five or six points tonight on why we have the overnight parking ban, what it means to the effectiveness. It's not gonna be as a thorough yeah. report as if we involve more staff, but so it depends. Like, like, There's a number of different procedural ways you can handle this. Okay, thank you, yeah. Gordon. So CAO, Bob. Uh, I, ju I just want to pick up on uh, Councillor Campbell's point that uh, the first issue at hand is do you want staff to work on this and it's clear uh, from his position right now he doesn't like to s he does not want to see resources expended on looking at it that he's probably satisfied with the status quo that any direction for staff to even look into it ought to come from council and rather than rather than committee if you were all on board and it was a slam dunk go ahead uh, that's easy to give direction but this is this is a committee meeting not a council meeting so we need to make that kind of technical distinction and that allows councillor Campbell or anyone else to vote against the motion and even if the motion passes it's clear what his position is Whereas, whereas this is more of a consensus thing, which is less of a contract than, than a vote. That's why I mentioned the wording of the motion. It should be a positive motion, then you're either for it or against it. The motion, the motion would be council direct staff to uh, look into the pros and cons of a winter parking ban, which is variable depending on the weather, and to come back Whatever. to uh, either committee or council with a report. But we're not a council right now, we're a committee, right? So do we right. have to do that in a council yeah. meeting? All I'm, all make I'm the suggesting direction is then. that you bring it forward right. to council, yes. that council gives yeah. the direction, right. not the committee, well. which really doesn't really have any authority to exactly. do that. Exactly, okay. Thank you, uh, CAO Bob. So I'm going to move this forward, uh, move it to our council meeting on December 16th um, for, oh. Okay, oh, all right, we have to wrap this up soon though, guys. No, okay. I'd just like to say that we need to get more timely on these things, like now that the snow has started to fall and residents are like, okay, this is our parking ban in place in the hours the chief said, it's what they're used to. We need to get ahead of these type of things if we're going to make changes for our residents because right now we'll have some people that might not be on social media and might not know and here we're going to be you know, doing these type of things. So if we're going to be, like when we're making decisions for the upcoming summer, we don't do it July 1st. Like we have to, we have to try and get ahead of this if we're going to do it. Yes. But just to that point, that until tonight, there was nothing to get ahead of. That's right. No, no, we, exactly. We have a system that we've used yes. for a number of years. It works yes. well. It yes. works well for parking enforcement. It works yeah. well for snow clearing. It sometimes leads yeah. to people being inconvenienced and yeah. But Whereas that's what I mean, like if a couple people bring it forward, then it's time to start discussing it. Maybe not like making a move and doing it right now, but discussing what our options could be for the future. And, and that was my exact point yep. here is that it, it's not an issue till it's an issue. So now right. they, it was mentioned to me and I said, you know what, it's, I didn't have a great answer for this. So the, this is the process that we're going through and yep. I just didn't want, just so everybody knows, I'm not trying to push it one way or the other. I just wanted information and see where it goes. Well, thank you everybody for your input. <laughs> We're learning as we go. Um, so what I'll do is I'm gonna say this for the third time. I'm gonna move this forward um, to the council uh, meeting on December 16th for a vote as to whether or not we may even move forward on this. Okay? Okay. So uh, with that, uh, police services uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Thank you. Councillor Snow, the floor is yours. Community services. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd like to call the Community Services Committee for December 3rd to order. Can I get an approval of the agenda? Can't see it. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Uh, we have one uh, item on the agenda, and that's active transportation strategy. That was uh, request to be put on the agenda from Councillor McFeely, so I'll turn it over to you, Councillor McFeely, and we'll move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This will be very brief tonight, I hope. Um, and it's kind of timely because um, uh, at our uh, September 30th, uh, Ward 7, Ward 8, 
uh, uh, town hall meeting, uh, we had questions regarding whether the city had an active transportation plan or an active transportation strategy and what it would take to for that to evolve. Um, I recall during our last, uh, during the previous council's term that we had a presentation from JP um, around active transportation and where the gaps were in the city in terms of having sort of a, a linear path that would allow people to move throughout the city, um, you know, by, by bike or by walking or by rollerblade or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I thought it would be useful for, for council to get the snippet of that presentation because it was, it was, it was quite sort of defining, I think, at the time that we, our gaps are pretty limited, really, that we, if we can fill in. Um, uh, subsequent to asking for this to be placed on the, the agenda back in October, I guess, but the, or the November meeting was, was uh, had a fairly lengthy agenda, so it was deferred to now. Subsequent to that, uh, we had our meeting with uh, Minister Myers and, uh, and the, the province uh, has announced sort of an active transportation strategy and some dollars that are available f to, uh, to municipalities that want to move forward with that active transportation plans. And, and um, you know, if you search around and look at active transportation plans in other cities, they're, they're, really, uh, they're, they're really around a few themes and, and um, you know, I, I don't think it would take a whole lot in the city of Summerside, uh, you know, to get to a place where we would have a, uh, a fairly well-established active transportation plan that would encourage people to, to bike, walk, run, whatever, throughout the city as opposed to using their vehicles and, uh, um, you know, tie it into our green plan. Uh, there's also significant research around active transportation and the impact on, on traffic calming, which is uh, uh, slowing traffic down in the city, using bike lanes to make roads narrower, uh, which is sort of a proven fact now that that slows traffic down. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, uh, of synergy between the two. Uh, as, as staff are developing sort of that traffic calming uh, plan that we had asked for, uh, for for budget, there may be some some synergy between active transportation and that traffic calming as well. So, so with that, uh, uh, I know JP has uh, some stuff there that he had uh, presented uh, to the previous council that was quite revealing in terms of where the gaps are. So, JP, I don't know if you have. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I didn't bring that pr oh. particular proposal tonight because I wasn't aware that we were going to be discussing it. Oh, okay. um, well, but I can dig it out for sure. And, no, and, uh, in, and in fairness, I think tonight is just kind of introducing <coughs> the concept and see if see if if your committee had any interest in moving forward and, and looking at it so that it's really uh, kind of unfair for me to expect you to have the presentation here tonight because I really see tonight is just sort of introducing the concept with this with your committee and this council and if there's an appetite to move forward then maybe the next step is yeah. is a brush off the presentation and yeah talk about it, so. the city has um, a fairly um, lengthy and, and, and detailed active transportation plan that was drafted by Murray Pinchuk back in the early 2000s um, a fairly grand plan, a fairly uh, sizable investment plan, but one that certainly would, we would be a leader in, in active transportation. The challenge with that plan has always been its size and, and its challenge to kind of phase it and its cost at budget time to really implement it. Uh, so we kind of took a different approach when we presented to the last council, I think it was in 2016, about some fairly easy things that we can do um, that do have a bit of a price tag along with them, however, can really be impactful from an active transportation perspective, bringing in all the communities in Summerside together. Um, and then with the recent announcement of Minister Myers and their, and their uh, intention of rolling out an active transportation plan that has yet to be rolled out, but will be in the new year, um, and subsequent to our meeting with Minister Myers, uh, there seems to be an appetite for some initial projects right off the bat. 
and we've got those. Uh, so I think the next steps would, you know, at least from my perspective, would be to, to, to put those priority projects in front of council at January committee and uh, with approval from council, get those projects in front of the staffers and the minister's office and start looking at those projects because obviously we'll have to come to the table with our share of those projects uh, in the 2020 budget process. So if that's a good direction from my yeah. chair or from other councillors. Yeah, I, I think the timing is excellent. Like we said, we've, we've met with Minister Myers and there seems to be definitely a plan from the province moving forward for some active transportation uh, funding to go roll out. And to JP's point, uh, they have uh, already have a plan sort of in place that we could move on relatively quickly. So it's a matter of uh, figuring out the dollar cents and, and getting ready for next budget time and maybe what the province has in store on their end. So. Uh, oh, can't go ahead, Bob. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Um, it's worth noting that there is uh, strong evidence of widespread public support for this, and that comes by way of the last three years we've had budget participation, public participation surveys, and every one of those surveys has had a question about reallocating some dollars from something to active transportation and I think we had a survey was it last year Rob that we had over 300 respondents <clears throat> which is a statistically significant number uh, with very strong support from that so uh, we know that <clears throat> there's not just a few you know uh, small minority but people like me that are really big on cycling lanes and things like that there is a large group of people in the city of Summerside that are really behind this sort of thing. So uh, I don't think you'd have any issue with uh, finding public support for. And we're going to contract Bob up. to do the work in his retirement in January. So uh, <laughs> no problem. Busy. We'll put, put him out on his bike and see if he survives and then we can. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say in a lot of areas, you're going to have to fill in the ditches to widen the streets for the bike. Uh, Anyhow, Mr. Chair, I didn't want to take up a lot of time tonight with the exception of introducing it and, and was planning on doing that prior to Minister Meyer's announcement. So it's really the icing on the cake and the stars appear to be aligned here to perhaps move that 2016 information that we received forward in a positive way. And I think most kind of proactive. Pardon me? No, he was in the transportation community was around busing yeah yeah uh, so I, I guess from here we'll just uh, JP if you want to bring back some information to our January committee uh, if that gives you enough time to bring back uh, information and uh, we'll move as a committee from there to move forward to hopefully some budget and talks with uh, the province on funding and so on sounds good good uh, we'll have a motion to adjourn. Councillor Adam, do you want to second that? All good. Adjourned. Your Worship, back to you. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just in uh, just speaking with you for a moment, we've moved the uh, one item on the financial to our Thursday, December 12th noon meeting. Uh, just to discuss with Director Philpott. So I'll take that off the agenda tonight. It's just one item. End of the agenda. There was one item here with the Armory's building, but maybe that's on later. I thought. Anyway, uh, it's a motion to adjourn, and we'll, I believe this is the committee of the whole. Moved by Greg and seconded by Bruce. Sorry, Councillor Campbell and Councillor McDougall. All in favor? Okay, let's take a 10 minutes.